Welcome to another virtual curator's tour of the Silver Eyes Center for Photography 2020 Benefit Auction. The auction supports our original exhibitions and our unique educational programs, and it keeps our gallery and its events free and open to all. Today, I want to share with you 13 works that I love, and somehow, as of today, which is Monday, July 6, all of these photos don't have a single bid on them yet. If you fall in love with any of these photographs, you can bid online at artsy.net. Bidding closes at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, July 9th. If you plan on bidding and you haven't registered for your Artsy account yet, I recommend that you make your account right away because sometimes it can take a day or two before your account is approved for bidding. Okay, let's get this tour started and head inside the gallery. Our first stop on the tour is lot number 15 by the legendary photographer Bill Brandt. Brandt is primarily recognized as a documentary photographer, although his work spanned many genres. His most well-known series, The English at Home, is a book that compared images of the aristocracy of Great Britain alongside photographs of the country's working class and manual laborers. This portrait is somewhat related to that series in that it shows um, two members of the aristocracy of Great Britain, Edith and her brother, Osbert Sitwell, who were members of a prominent British family. Both Edith and Osbert belong to elite and esoteric circles of writers, poets, artists, and academics, and they were notorious in their lifetime for their eccentric behaviors. Now this photograph is titled Edith and Osbert Sitwell Beneath the Family by Sergeant Renshaw Hall, Derbyshire, 1945. And of course, Beneath the Sergeant refers to the John Singer Sergeant painting that is above them in the upper right hand corner of the painting, which is a family portrait of the Sitwells. So the two babies in the upper right hand corner, right above Osbert's head, are Edith and Osbert, uh, shown as children in this kind of decadent and glorious painting. Um, it's a really masterful image by Brandt. It's a portrait of uh, the creative class, the elite class of Great Britain, um, with this ostentatious show of wealth, this you know, uh, commission painting by a legend. And Edith is sitting rigid, upright, hands tightly clasped, um, and both gazing intently into Brandt's cameras. Uh, I think this is a really special Brandt photograph, and one that hints at a almost sort of darker side that's surrounding the family's wealth, of course. Um, Edith sort of dressed all in black with her, her large hat. A really, really wonderful picture, um, and one that I hope uh, you'll consider bidding on. So our next stop on the tour brings us to uh, Lot 17 by Sean Stewart. Sean Stewart is Silver Eye's very own lab manager, and in, in addition to being an exceptional lab manager, printmaker, uh, framer, and just all around general expert at all the production that goes into all of Silver Eye's shows, Sean is an exceptional photographer. And his work uh, for the last several years has really focused on the working class people and places in and around uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. Now, this image is untitled After Evans. Uh, it was made in 2018. It's a diptych, so it's a two-paneled piece. Now, Sean took this photo while he was photographing in Mount Pleasant, PA, and at one point he noticed that the statue that he was seeing that you see in the left part of the panel looks somewhat familiar in that it was a World War I memorial statue. Eventually he realized it was famous because it was famously seen in a Walker Evans photograph from 1935 titled Main Street of a Pennsylvania Town. Uh, which you'll see in the next slide. So after Sean took this photo, he turned around and he noticed a kind of jumble of construction and signs and debris um, in an image that very much struck him as an Evans-esque image. Uh, Evans, of course, was, was notorious for his love of photographing signage and especially kind of small town, rural America signage. And Sean snapped this picture. So as you'll see in this next slide, uh, you can see the relationship. So here on the left, we have the uh, original 1935 photo of Mount Pleasant and the World War I uh, memorial statue. And here, you know, I just picked one of many images of signs that Evans made that showed his love of really layering an image deeply with sign and text and graphics um, as, as Sean made in his kind of contemporary ode to Walker Evans. So it's a really lovely diptych and I think a beautiful ode to one of the most influential photographers of the 20th century, Walker Evans. So 
something I hope, again, you'll consider uh, as you look through the auction lots. Our next stop on the tour, um, two lots, um, lots 29 and lot 30 by Shane Lavalette. Both of these images uh, were commissioned by the High Museum in Atlanta as a project called Picturing the South. Now this is kind of an interesting project for Shane to get involved in because he's a native of the Northeast. He's from Vermont. And as he began to research and explore for this project, he found himself connecting to the landscape of the South primarily through music and, and music traditions such as blues and gospel. The first image you see is Will with Banjo, where we see a young boy in a misty field. The young boy here named Will, we see gazing behind him, a really beautiful, calm, quiet pastoral scene um, and one that is easy to get lost in and kind of picture yourself in the field. The second image by Shane in the auction is Lot 29 and it's titled Ground Zero. In this picture, Shane shows us a tightly cropped corner of the Ground Zero Blues Club in Clarksdale, Mississippi, a location long held as Ground Zero for blues aficionados around the world. This image shows a guitar-shaped uh, tabletop, absolutely covered in graffiti, uh, scrawls everywhere on the posters, on the table, even lovely little details like how people have written on the individual slats in the, in the blinds covering the window. The human element of so many people in this bar coming to see the music and also expressing themselves through the graffiti. It's, it's a really kind of overwhelming image in a, in a beautiful way and, and an image I, I really love. So next on the tour, I want to show you Lot 49 by Melissa Catanese, which is untitled The Lottery from 2020. To create her books and photographs, Melissa often works with found and archived imagery, sequencing and montaging images to create unexpected narratives and to bring forth new meanings. Um, in some cases, like in this image, she combines found images with photographs she's taken herself. I love Melissa's use of found images and sequencing because it puts you in such a mysterious, questioning place. Um, and this image belongs to our ongoing series, The Lottery, which takes its name from the celebrated, the celebrated haunting short story by Shirley Jackson. Both the fictional tale and Catanese's imagery share themes of anxiety, fear, isolation, beauty, and violence. In these two images, which comprise the work, Catanese shows us unknown figures struggling to climb up a giant sand dune alongside a reddish cliffside slowly collecting rocky debris at the base. I think when I look at Catanese's imagery, I love to get lost in the questions. I don't try to solve what's going on. I just enjoy the mystery that happens through them. Um, and the other thing I really love about Melissa's work is the qualities of the paper and of the collage. So of course, uh, her her many books are, are really beautifully sequenced, but they're they're sort of single, single seamless printed pages, but her collage work often has many different textures. Uh, in this one, you can see the, the paper is just slightly coming off the backboard. Um, the different qualities of papers, I think, are really beautiful, uh, really subtle, and, and just kind of bring this print together in a really interesting and exceptional way. So the next picture, uh, right next to Melissa, is a photograph by Dan Boardman. Um, this is lot 26, and it's called The Highest Function, and it's from 2014. Dan Boardman's striking photo collages uh, are made entirely in camera, so I'm not sure if collage is really the right word for it. He uses hand-cut masks and stencils that he places on top of his film, and he kind of readjusts these masks inside the camera, making many, many separate exposures uh, that come up with a final image. The title of this work comes from the well-known self-help book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and Boardman had come into contact with a person who was heavily invested in the principles of the book and was leading a kind of book discussion group, help group, based on the seven habits of highly effective people. And Boardman began photographing them in a documentary way, but by the end decided that this kind of collage-based, creative, almost drawing-inspired way was, was a more effective way of sort of evoking the transcendence of the, um, of the themes of the book.
these images feel kind of unbound from one specific time or place because they have so many different images happening in them. Uh, and they uproot the traditional conceits of photography, of course, which show us one fixed time in space. Um, instead, we see multiple moments simultaneously evoking the feeling of work of art, which is kind of constantly renewing a cycle of life. My next stop on the tour is, again, right next door to Dan's piece. This is Lot 27 by Joseph Dessler Costa. Costa is influenced by his training as a commercial photographer, and he often fuses elements of consumerism with a fine art approach to photography. Stylistically, his work pays homage to the kind of advertising of the 1970s and the 1980s, considering the way commercial imagery became imbued with, with a sense of sensationalized glamour and a larger-than-life personality. In this image, Costa uses the instantly recognizable imagery of the, quote, jazz design paper cup. This style of paper cup was introduced in 1992, and the teal and purple jagged lines of the design became an icon of 1990s culture. Uh, and myself, as a 90s kid, I um, identify strongly with this image. It's just so strange to me that this cup has such a, a strong emotional response to me from countless baseball games and pizza parties and just sort of felt like a, a ubiquitous kind of object in the 90s. Interestingly, eventually this jazz paper cup was bought by the Solo Cup Company and became unofficially known as Solo Jazz. Here Costa abstracts the fragments of the familiar patterning, rendering it as a conceptual fine art object, all the cups tossed in the air on this bright white background kind of blending into each other. The next piece I want to talk about is Lot 79 by John Opera, which is called Toilet A. Uh, Opera made this piece in 2014, and this is actually a toned cyanotype that is made on stretched raw linen. So there's a really beautiful, um, rich material quality to this picture. And again, if you can come to the gallery, one of the, one of the main reasons to see this in person. Opera's photographs revel in the individual spirit of transcendentalism, something he's explored in other projects with his work. And he focuses on things that are mundane, specific, and personal, and they evoke emotional and unexpected uh, reactions. Toilet A is part of the Cyanotype on Linen series, which presents banal objects encountered in daily life. The double exposure technique and the subject matter of the toilet seat recall the early 20th century experimental photographs by people like Man Ray, Lee Miller, and of course the modernist studies of Edward Weston, where he photographed the uh, famous toilet in Mexico. So a lot of interesting references with the, with the subject in this picture. Next, I want to show you Lot 36 by Raymond Meeks. This is called Animal Companion, number 688 and it was made in 2015. Um, Meeks is, is known for his images and of course he's known for his photo books uh, and his photo books often evoke this kind of quiet dreamlike approach and in, in this quality of printing where the, there's nothing quite like a Raymond Meeks print. It really in my opinion it kind of glows with this silvery haze um, that thinks about a lot of his subjects like family, memory, the importance of place, um, and of course in this picture, uh, the importance of animals in our lives. This photograph belongs to a series in which Meeks and his partner, Adriana Alt, visited uh, several animal shelters in New Orleans and, and photographed uh, the dogs and, and other animals that they saw. Here we see a dog standing within a fence enclosure, and the dog, you know, you can sense a kind of mel melancholy uh, but also a sweetness um, and perhaps even a tinge of optimism that this dog might find a new home. It's a private moment. It's an intimate moment. You know, Meeks is close to the ground level. The focus in the foreground is soft and, and it just sort of sharpens right around the dog's hind leg. It's a really beautiful, beautiful image and, and the way the dog is kind of split by this fence post in the photograph sort of shows him in this state of limbo, uh, kind of between worlds, really Really wonderful picture. So next I want to show you a photograph by the great Richard Rinaldi. Um, this is Lot 75. And it's called Ebo Island, Mozambique, taken in 2018. 
Rinaldi has been celebrated for his long-standing and innovative relationship to portrait photography, using his camera as an extension of his eye to slow down and engage his subjects fully. And he's got many uh, wonderful books um, if you want to explore more of his portrait photography. I think he's really a, a, a master of the form. Um, in this image, a young boy in Mozambique, Rinaldi complicates the portrait with ideas of cultural and capitalistic influences. And that's because what drew Richard to this photograph was, in fact, the uh, Star Wars shirt that the boy is wearing, these kind of uh, stormtrooper pattern that's all over. And this is part of a, a larger pattern where Rinaldi has photographed people that he's come across who are wearing Star Wars t-shirts, all sorts of t-shirts all over the world, um, kind of united by this uh, culture of fandom. Um, or perhaps, you know, maybe they just are wearing the shirt for some other reason other than that they're a fan. But a, a beautiful, a quiet moment um, with really compelling and interesting cultural overtones because of this t-shirt. Um, and just checking out the book is, is a, it's a really wonderful um, new book that he made that, that has a great sense of um, fun and humor and play and also considers some of the more serious implications of this um, cultural force that, that, that is a part of our lives of Star Wars. So the next picture that I want to show you on the tour is by Lewis Fowler. Um, this is lot 10 and it's called Penn Station, New York, New York, Couple at Lockers, taken in 1946. And this is a more contemporary print made in 1990. I think of Fowler as an under-recognized master of street photography. And he's often associated with uh, the kind of loose school of New York street photographers um, from the 40s and 50s, um, people like Deanne Arbus, Robert Frank, and William Klein, making really beautiful, candid, intimate shots of life in New York in that era. His images often fuse the kind of grittiness and humanity that existed side by side that we associate with New York in that era, showing his interest not just in the physical surroundings, but in the psychological energy of his subjects in urban life. And this image in Penn Station exemplifies this attitude uh, a Fowler captures um, candidly a couple who's having a very emotional embrace and encounter in Penn Station. The gesture is seemingly romantic, but perhaps uh, there's more to it. Maybe the embrace is too strong or maybe the man's gaze is, is unwelcome. It's, it's hard to kind of discern exactly what's going on, but this is something I love about a Fowler image is it, it asks you so many questions and it asks a lot of your imagination to kind of fill in the, the gaps of what's going on, which is which is what I think what a lot of the best street photography does. So it's a, a photographer that, that I think is really worth learning more about if you have an interest in the genre and, and someone who I think is, is quite interesting. The next stop on our tour, um, the penultimate stop as we're at photograph number 12 here is by Bruce Kratzley, another underrecognized photographer based in New York. Kratzley was a queer photographer who was working largely in the 1970s and the 1980s. His black and white photographs have an uncanny ability to evoke the delicacy and ephemerality of life through their play with light and shadow. His works echo the formal and conceptual qualities of many of the seminal artists he admired, such as uh, Ache, Eugene Smith, and his teacher, the great Lisette Modell. Well, he was known for capturing the people and frenzied street scenes of New York, uh, including the annual gay pride parade and the East Village Drag Festival known as Wigstock. There's also a quieter thread which runs through his career, and they are these compelling images of museum objects and architecture taken often through layers of re reflection um, using the glass and the reflections caused in the glass to develop this deep um, dreamy state. Uh, in this image from the Louvre Museum in Paris uh, sits Houdini's top hat um, and his wand and they're sealed in a glass vitrine. This kind of ode to the great magician uh, taken with this very surrealist inspired uh, gaze using reflections uh, and the artist's shadow itself can be seen in this print kind of receding with the multiple reflections from the lighting within the museum case. Um, you know, creates a, uh, uh, creates a magical, uh, almost eerie theme, a really 
beautiful and, and I think transporting photograph. Um, again, another artist who I think uh, should be much more well known uh, than he is. And finally, our last stop on the tour is Lot 67 by Dylan Batone. Um, Dylan has been working in the wide panoramic format for several years, uh, capturing a number of different things, but one of his most favorite and enduring subjects is the hillsides and people of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This image, Rainbow, where if you look closely in the middle of the, the dead middle of the frame, you can see a very faint rainbow um, coming over the hillside. Uh, we see this really lush, verdant, dark green hillside, um, which if you live in Pittsburgh, as, as we do, you recognize from everywhere all summer long. And uh, oftentimes the hillsides such as this one are just coated in this invasive um, knotweed uh, plant that just grows and grows and covers the entire hillside and can be really destructive, but in its own way creates this beautiful kind of blanketing feature. Um, and these beautiful hillsides of Pittsburgh uh, and valleys that they create um, creates an image that, that is kind of otherworldly, almost prehistoric, but you can see the the little houses that dot the frame as well. So something really, really beautiful. And again, I think uh, an image as, as you should with all of these that is well, well worth considering a bid. Thank you so much for taking this virtual tour with me. Um, please reach out to myself. You can find me at david at silvereye.org or our assistant curator, Kate Kelly, and she is at kate at silvereye.org. Any questions about any of the lots that we talked about or any of the lots in the whole auction, um, thank you so much and happy bidding.